One ice frappuccino for me, please, and with a double shot. Now, I suspect this is something you'd never hear if you traveled 100,000 years ago to check out on your super great-great-great-grandparents. First off, you wouldn't hear anything resembling human speech for a simple reason. The early humans developed a capacity for language about 50,000 years ago. So, to talk to your ancestors, you'd need to use some of the oldest forms of human communication, including talking or making sounds, drawing or painting, dancing, acting, and using symbols. For example, if you made some weird noises like grunts or guttural sounds, it would mean you're trying to communicate with your peeps or warn them about something. Another reason why no one would grab ice frappuccino back then is that 100,000 years ago, Earth was going through a serious ice age. Who wants an icy, refreshing drink in the middle of winter? It wasn't quite a full-blown glacial period, but it was definitely way colder than it is now. The sea levels were low and there were glaciers everywhere, which made it super tough for our early human ancestors to get around. Some even kicked the bucket while trying to migrate to other areas, especially up in Northern America and Europe. Back in the day when humans were still figuring out this whole survival thing, they chowed down on some pretty, you know, fancy stuff. We're talking tartar steak, sashimi, you name it. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit. It wasn't an iconic fresh dish, but raw meat. Not a Japanese cuisine stable, but a plain fish. There weren't Michelin restaurants serving fancy dishes and Gordon Ramsay recipes, but prehistoric foodies happily munched on nuts, seeds, and berries. And you know what? Their lifestyle is gaining popularity today. And there's even a so-called paleo diet. Paleo stands for the Paleolithic period. The idea is all about eating like our early human ancestors did. Some scientists believe that our genes haven't quite caught up to the modern diet that came from farming. Thanks to farming, we've got grains, legumes, and dairy galore. But it turns out that these changes in our diet happen faster than our bodies could keep up with it. A hundred thousand years ago, humans roaming around were basically just like us in terms of looks and DNA, but their houses were far from being modern. Actually, those were just caves. They couldn't even buy a mere bed in Ikea. <laughs> Scientists in South Africa just discovered what they're calling the world's oldest bed. And no, it's not a fancy mattress with adjustable firmness settings. It's actually made of grass. Archaeologists stumbled upon mats of grass and sedge that were stacked half an inch thick on the floor of a rock shelter. And get this, the bedding is 77,000 years old. That's like 40,000 years older than the previous record holder. The mats were covered with leaves from a tree called the river wild quince, which repels pesky insects. These prehistoric folks were basically having a bed and breakfast situation going on in their cave. But let's be real, living in a cave is pretty gross. Insects, rot, and lice are just a few of the issues. But instead of bouncing to a new spot when things got nasty, these people burned their bedding and made new ones. Yeah, seems like 100,000 years ago, life on Earth was totally wild. Sure, microbes and amphibians were chilling for billions of years before that, but things were way different back then. So during a prehistoric trip, you could have bumped into one of the biggest mammoths ever. Yup, the Colombian mammoth was a beast. Standing at 13 feet tall and weighing over 10 tons, it had curved tusks that were even longer than its body, somewhere over 16 feet. These weren't like those woolly mammoths you see in movies with their thick brown fur. The Colombian mammoths didn't need that kind of coat, because they didn't live in the icy regions of Europe and North America. But don't let their lack of fur trick you. These creatures were massive and could have been a real threat to humans who lived near them even though they were plant eaters. 
Another beast you'd stay away from is Toxodon. This land animal had some seriously cool curved teeth that gave it its name. It looked like a rhino, but with some similarities to rodents, too. The last one was spotted only 5,000 years ago, and that's pretty recent in the grand scheme of things. Charles Darwin even used the Toxodon as an example to explain evolution and anatomical differences. Some people think it might have been semi-aquatic, but its grass-eating habits suggest otherwise. Not only was the Earth full of cool animals, but it also had a diverse human population. There were all sorts of new species popping up left and right, and they were on the move, looking for a better place to call home than Africa's dry and dusty areas. One of those species was Homo floresiensis, aka the hobbits. These little guys were only about 3 feet tall and hunted for their food using stone tools. They were totally unknown until recently, when scientists found their remains in caves all over the world. Homo erectus were the first humans who actually looked like us. They were total trendsetters, standing upright and all. They were the first to explore outside of Africa and check out other continents. These guys were pretty smart, too, making cool tools and even cooking their own food. But unfortunately, they got a little too comfortable and lazy. They didn't keep up with the changing climate and eventually went extinct. It's a shame, really, because while other humans were hustling to improve their tools and survive, Homo erectus just couldn't keep up with the times. Lesson learned, don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Homo sapien Neanderthals were basically our ancient cousins who lived in Europe and Asia. They were pretty smart and used fancy stone tools to hunt and survive. But let's not get too carried away with their intelligence, okay? The media likes to hype them up as geniuses, but there's not a ton of evidence to back that up. Modern people are the only non-extinct human species. You and I are part of the Homo sapiens sapiens subgroup that roamed the Earth 100,000 years ago, too. We were so smart that we even migrated out of Africa to Europe and Asia. Our intelligence was apparent from the very beginning. By the way, the era we're traveling in was called the Stone Age, as back then, people learned how to tame stones. That was a tremendously large era that started over 2 million years ago, and it only finished in 3300 BCE. Let's dive into Plombos Cave. It's a super cool spot located in the Plombos Private Nature Reserve on the southern Cape Coast of South Africa. The cave may be small, only around 430 square feet, but it's got a big history. Early modern humans were all about Plombos Cave, visiting repeatedly between 100,000 to 70,000 years ago before a sand dune partially sealed the entrance. Above the sand dune, you'll find material from the later Stone Age. The coolest discovery? Two pieces of ochre with geometric engravings that were found in 2002, marking one of the earliest signs of symbolic communication among early modern humans. It's about 75,000 years old. And it doesn't stop there. More engraved ochre pieces have been found in later excavations, proving that this type of communication has been around for ages. Plus, they found red lines of ochre drawn on a rock that dates back to 73,000 years ago, showing that painting was also happening back then. Also, in 2008, they discovered a 100,000-year-old ochre processing workshop with a couple of toolkits at Plumbos Cave. These toolkits consisted of two abalone shells containing an ochre mixture that was possibly used for painting or other purposes. Our technology has sure made a quantum jump since the first tool ever was invented. But just so you know, it all started with pointed stones in Plumbos Cave. Yeah, probably the reason why you have the internet today is because some prehistoric dude in Plumbos Cave learned how to use pressure flaking and managed to sharpen the very first stone ever. 
And there were some inventions in between that. But yeah. The profession of a travel blogger is far more ancient than you can imagine. Yeah, the first ones appeared around 2,500 years ago. Meet Herodotus, historian, travel blogger, genius, billionaire, philanthropist. Just kidding. Herodotus had been all over the place, and by the time he hit 60, he had seen more spots than anyone else on Earth. As Instagram wasn't around yet, he had to whip out his papyrus and wrote what we now know as the first ever travel guide, the history. In his book, he spilled the tea on people, places, animals, and plants. He was particularly fond of Egypt. By the way, most of the stuff Herodotus described is still there, so his guide is not that outdated even today. If you're ever in Egypt, you can actually check out the same monuments and sites Herodotus saw. One spot that Herodotus cruised to was Lake Morris down the Nile. This place was legit, a freshwater lake that got its water straight from the Nile. There was this city called Crocodopolis chilling on its shores. Yep, there were a lot of crocodiles there. That city is also still around today, just under a different name, Fayum. Right in the middle of Lake Morris, there were two giant pyramids that took Herodotus' breath away. Here comes the mystery. At the moment, these two pyramids are gone. Seems like, according to the travel guide, we're missing two Egyptian pyramids. Herodotus claimed Lake Morris was man-made, like someone dug it up with their bare hands. He thought so because there were two pyramids smack dab in the middle of the lake. But let's face it, it would have been physically impossible to build something like that in a natural lake. I mean, the ancient Egyptians were pretty advanced, but they definitely didn't have scuba divers and all the essential equipment back then. The pyramids were 50 fathoms above the surface and another 50 fathoms below. Just to give you an idea, one fathom equals six feet. So those pyramids were around 600 feet tall. That's taller than the famous Pyramid of Giza. And while the Pyramid of Giza has a modest little capstone, these twin pyramids had statues of pharaohs chilling on top. That's why you've never heard of them and there are only a couple of drawings depicting them. So what happened? Well, time is ruthless. Take the great labyrinth Herodotus mentioned, for example. Nowadays, it's just a pile of rubble and cobwebs. Even the once magnificent Lake Morris has changed. The water there has turned salty, and now it's just a fraction of its original size. Sure, change is inevitable, but you would think pyramids would stand strong against the test of time, right? Their unique designs make them super durable. So where are these pyramids now? Well, chances are they never actually existed. We all know that some travel bloggers tend to exaggerate, right? Herodotus was no exception. While some people call him the father of history, Others call him the father of lies. Ouch! Yeah, his books have false or unverified information sometimes. For example, he totally blew up the size of the Pyramid of Giza in his guidebook. He doubled its size. But hey, cut the guy some slack. In the pre-Google era when our travel blogger lived, fact-checking was pretty complicated, especially for Herodotus who couldn't even read those funky Egyptian hieroglyphics. He had to rely on the locals for info. Those inconsistencies in Herodotus' book might be just one epic prank pulled by mischievous locals on a clueless tourist. Classic. However, there are actually some legit monuments at the site. The pedestals of Bayamu are the leftover bases of two ginormous statues built by the ancient Egyptian pharaoh Amenemhat III. These ruins used to grace the shores of Lake Morris, but now they chill in the Fayum oasis about four miles north of Fayum City. The first time these statues were mentioned was by, you guessed it right, the Greek historian Herodotus, who was around in the 5th century BCE. Remember the description? Herodotus said there were two pyramids that soared 50 fathoms above the water's surface, and each pyramid had a massive statue sitting on the throne at the top. We have the statues, but not the pyramids. Weird, right? There's an explanation, though. Some scientists believe that Herodotus probably wrote about these statues during a time when the area was flooded. But hey, it's not just Herodotus who spun this tale. Diodorus the Sicilian and Pliny the Elder also jumped on the bandwagon, repeating similar claims about these colossal statues. However, let's not forget that Herodotus might have been a bit lazy. 
He never actually got up close and personal with the statues. He just saw them from across the lake. So picture this, hazy silhouettes in the distance and Herodotus's imagination running wild with their grandeur. The description matches, except for the height. While Lake Morris pyramids seem to be a myth debunked, there's another mystery waiting to be unveiled. Some time ago, archaeology researcher Angela Mickel dropped a crazy discovery. She claimed to have found not one, but two lost pyramid sites in Egypt. The craziest part is that she didn't even have to leave her couch to find them. She basically found those pyramids online. After spending 10 years studying Google Earth, Angela managed to pinpoint these two areas along the Nile Basin. They're about 90 miles apart and both have some funky shaped mounds. The first one is chilling by the Nile in Upper Egypt, just 12 miles away from Abu Sidum. The second one, 90 miles north, has a 140 feet wide four-sided shape. The second site even has a massive triangular plateau that's a staggering 620 feet wide. Angela wrote on Google Earth Anomalies back in 2012, saying that the mound looked super flat on top and had a crazy symmetrical triangular shape that had been worn away over time. And the second site? It got this square center that's totally out of the ordinary for a mound this size. It almost looks like a pyramid when you see it from above. But not everyone is convinced. Some Egyptologists say these mounds are just geological features called buttes. Apparently, they're pretty common in the local Fayum Desert. These buttes form when sediment piles up and there's a stubborn layer that doesn't want to erode. So when the surrounding sediment washes away, that tough layer stays put and makes the hill all flat. Still, this one's just a theory as of now. By the way, Egyptian archaeologists just made one more incredible discovery. This time, it's not a theory, but an actual site. In January 2023, they found a complete residential city from the Roman era right in the heart of Luxor, a southern city in Egypt. This ancient city dating back 1800 years to the 2nd and 3rd centuries is actually the oldest and most important city ever found on the eastern bank of Luxor. The archaeologists uncovered a bunch of awesome stuff during their excavations. They found several residential buildings, two pigeon towers that were used to house pigeons or doves, and even some metal workshops. Inside those workshops, they stumbled upon a treasure trove of pots, tools, and Roman coins made of bronze and copper. It's like a real-life time capsule. This kind of find is pretty rare in Egypt. Usually, they come across temples and tombs during excavations, especially on Luxor's West Bank, where the famous Valley of the Queens and Valley of the Kings are located. But this time, it's all about this amazing residential city. And get this, back in April 2021, they announced the discovery of a lost golden city on Luxor's West Bank that's 3,000 years old. The archaeological team called it the largest ancient city ever found in Egypt. It's like they're uncovering hidden treasures left and right. What makes a giant, well, a giant? You know, big, enormous, you get it. Tough questions. It depends on who you ask. The ancient Greeks had Cyclops. Well, ogres were spread out through all sorts of European folklore tales. The tallest person ever recorded was named Robert Pershing Wadlow, and he lived in the first half of the 20th century. He stood at an incredible 8 feet 11 inches tall, but had many medical issues throughout his life. Sadly, he only lived to celebrate his 22nd birthday. That's because Robert wasn't just tall. He had a condition affecting his human growth hormone, which didn't particularly make his life comfortable. Robert even had to wear leg braces in his adult years. During that same time, incredible discoveries were reported in North America. Some people claim to have uncovered weird-looking skeletons, much larger than previously associated with human beings. It immediately raised the question, did giants really used to roam our planet? Our story begins with the idea of a mound builder race. Some scientists back in the day claimed that these massive earthworks in places like the Mississippi Valley, called the Grave Creek Mound or the Great Serpent Mound, were built by some sort of prehistoric type of human, much larger and stronger than us Homo sapiens are today. 
From around 1812 to the 1860s, almost everyone in America writing about history was covering this mound-building race. However, not everyone agreed with the theory. There was this naturalist named Benjamin Smith Barton, for example, who warned about jumping to conclusions about giants. He believed that just because people discovered some big bones, they shouldn't immediately think of giants. But people didn't listen. Really? They simply wanted to believe about huge human-like creatures, despite not having any real scientific evidence. Newspapers were filled with these giant stories. They described finding giant skeletons, even featuring weird body parts. Con artists took advantage of the whole frenzy, with some putting together skeletons out of wood and rawhide and touring them as proof of the long-lost race of giants. Eventually, in the 1930s, an anthropologist from the Smithsonian took it upon himself to debunk the whole mystery. And his conclusions were straightforward. All those giant skeletons that were supposedly uncovered were either hoaxes or simply animal bones that were wrongly identified as belonging to humans. He also said that those who claimed to have discovered ancient giant remains were just not that good with human anatomy. You would think that's how the story ended. Well, it didn't. You see, people became so convinced that giants existed that they simply could not let go. Sound familiar? Because the Smithsonian was investigating these claims, some people started thinking they were up to something shady. They cooked up this theory that the Smithsonian scientists were secretly getting rid of giant bones to hide the truth about giants. This whole story survived through the years and made it all the way to 2014. It's when this internet article said that the Smithsonian used to have tons of giant skeletons but destroyed them back in the early 1900s. And the drama continued. A famed publication even looked into the past of some of those Smithsonian scholars to try and pick apart their credibility. So the institute had to do some damage control. They've since added new people on the team whose job is to figure out if those bones were correctly collected and studied. Now, it wasn't just North Americans that claimed to have stumbled upon giants. The French had their own discoveries, too. Their story takes us back to 1890, when an anthropologist was digging around a Bronze Age site in Castineau, France. What he found were three bone pieces that looked like they came from a giant human. The findings included a massive thigh bone, a shin bone, and a regular upper arm bone known as a humerus. Now, if we put all these bones together and calculate the proportions, they lead us to this towering figure, somewhere between 10 and 11 feet tall. However, in 2022, contemporary scientists took another look at those bones. They concluded they most likely belonged to a cave bear, not a human. It wasn't that unusual for people back in the day to confuse giant animal bones with those of humans. Now, the truth is, our ancestors were in fact taller than we are today, despite them not being technically giants. The average human body has changed a lot over thousands of years. We're not as big and strong as our ancestors were. In fact, we've been on a bit of a downsizing trend, especially in the last 10,000 years. And it's because of a mix of factors. Our genes, the world around us, and how we live our lives all play a role. Way back around 40,000 years ago, European men were towering at around 6 feet. They had a seriously tough life, though, hunting and gathering all day. That lifestyle required a good muscle structure, and their African roots might have given them that extra height, which came in handy in warm climates. Moving on to 10,000 years ago, we can already see a big change in European males. They went down to 5 feet 4 inches on average. What happened was the climate was shifting, and people were increasingly relying on agriculture to provide for their families. It wasn't all sunshine and comfort, though. Sometimes, failed crops and a not-so-diverse food meant a pretty unhealthy diet. Plus, being around farm animals more and more introduced some new medical issues to the mix. We're now around 600 years ago when the shortness continued. And yes, we can still blame it on poor diet and health. However, there seems to be a change in recent years. Today, European males are reaching an average of 5 feet 9 inches, 
And sure, the fact that we're eating more veggies and getting regular checkups at the doctor did help a lot. But it's also because of industrialization and living in cities. This has brought people from different backgrounds together, which is a good thing. It decreases the chances of human passing on genes that could cause problems. So it's a combination of better living and genetics that's making us taller. We shouldn't give up on ancient giants quite yet, though. You see, experts believe they recently discovered the remains of such a person, who supposedly lived in ancient Egypt. Sometimes people can actually grow to large sizes due to a condition called gigantism, the same that made Robert Pershing Wadlow grow to such an impressive height. When some archaeologists were studying ancient Egyptian mummies, they came upon an interesting skeleton. What made it special was that they believed it might have belonged to a pharaoh, who would have been really tall, like 6 feet 6 inches tall. To put that in perspective, that's way taller than Ramses II, who was the tallest recorded Egyptian pharaoh and stood at about 5 feet 9 inches. These experts took a closer look at the newly found bones, especially the long ones, and found evidence of something called exuberant growth which basically means this person's growth was off the charts. It's a clear sign of gigantism, they say. Now, this discovery is important because it makes this mummy the oldest case of gigantism in the world. No other Egyptian pharaohs were known to be giants. It's also fascinating because it tells us something about the health and nutrition of ancient Egyptian rulers. See, those pharaohs were probably better fed and healthier than regular people which might explain why they could grow taller than the average person. Now, you might be wondering if being a giant had any drawbacks back then. Well, it's hard to say. I wasn't around then. Still, during those early dynasties in Egypt, they seemed to prefer shorter people, especially in royal service. There are a lot of ancient Egyptian stories featuring short-statured leaders and even higher spirits that locals looked up to. The reason why is still a mystery that we might never fully solve. But since this mummy was found in an elite tomb, it's possible that being a giant didn't have a social stigma attached to it at the time. Maybe he was, in fact, seen as special. Hold on to your hats, folks, because we're about to embark on an incredible journey. With the help of super smart scientists and their studies, We've asked AI to take us back a mind-blowing 2 billion years in time and show us what our awesome Earth looked like. So buckle up and let's find out. Once upon a time, way back when Earth was just a baby, around 4.5 billion years ago, hopping into a time machine and paying a visit would have been a big mistake. The whole place was a hot mess. First of all, the ground was still all gooey and molten, so landing your time machine would have been a major risk. Now, as soon as you tried to get out, you would see a completely different Earth compared to what we know today. The landscape is a patchwork of rugged mountains, sparkling seas, and vast stretches of land. Picture massive volcanoes erupting in fiery bursts, shooting gases and ash into the air. It's like a crazy fireworks show. And even if you had a fancy new machine that could hover and had special shields to handle the heat, you'd still have a hard time breathing. You see, the early Earth's atmosphere is a bit moody. Thick clouds hang in the sky, casting mysterious shadows on the land below. The air is as thin as a whisper and filled with all sorts of interesting gases like hydrogen and helium. Carbon dioxide swirls around, giving everything a vibrant green hue. Water vapor drifts through the air, creating a sense of humidity and a refreshing mist. Oh, and there might be a hint of ammonia and methane just to keep things interesting. Lots of cool gases, huh? But wait, there's something missing. Oxygen. So if you take a deep breath, you won't feel that familiar rush of air filling your lungs. On land, there are no lush forests or towering trees just yet. Instead, you find rugged, rocky terrains. Some of these ancient rocks bear the marks of intense forces, collisions and earthquakes that have shaped the land over millions of years. But amidst all this ancient beauty, something amazing is about to happen. Life, in its early stages, is evolving and preparing for its grand entrance. Simple organisms, like algae and bacteria, rule the scene. They thrive in the oceans, using the abundant carbon dioxide to grow and multiply. The waters are teeming with activity, with colorful, microscopic life forms buzzing around like a busy city. 
These tiny organisms are working hard, releasing oxygen as they go about their business. They're like little factories, slowly changing the composition of the atmosphere. So this is what the early Earth looked like, more or less. But why was it so nasty? And how could it have changed so much since then? You see, Earth's heat came from all sorts of crazy things happening during its formation. First off, there was some serious heat already packed into the objects that came together to make our planet. Then, as Earth grew bigger and stronger, its gravitational force got a major power boost. It pulled in more stuff, but it also gave Earth a massive bear hug, squeezing everything tightly. And you know what happens when things get squeezed? They heat up like a pressure cooker. This crazy heating had a huge impact on Earth's structure. Picture Earth as a mixed up bag of rocks, metals, and minerals. But as things heated up, the rocks and metals got so toasty that they melted. And guess what? The denser metal sank to the center and became Earth's core, while the lighter rocky stuff floated up to become the crust and mantle. It was like Earth decided to unmix itself, creating separate layers. Scientists call this wild separation differentiation. But the heating didn't stop there. With all this mixing and moving around, Earth got even hotter. It was like turning up the heat in a giant planetary oven. All this crazy heat had some serious consequences. Earth's high temperature made everything super speedy. Tectonic plates were dancing like there was no tomorrow, making the surface super active and full of geological shenanigans. Oh, and that's not all. Earth also got showered by some serious cosmic visitors. Imagine this. While Earth was busy gathering up all sorts of space debris during its formation, the rest of the solar system was causing some major chaos. Saturn and Jupiter decided to shake things up by changing their orbits, sending a whole bunch of massive objects hurtling towards poor Earth. These collisions were no joke. They packed a punch that melted minerals in Earth's crust and even vaporized them. These booms were so intense that they even blew gases right out of Earth's atmosphere. Talk about a wild fireworks show. Believe it or not, we can still spot ancient battle scars from these collisions. It takes some careful detective work, but we can catch a glimpse of their aftermath. For example, there's this place called the Manitsok Crater in Greenland. Even though there's no actual crater to see, we can examine rocks that were chilling 12.5 to 15.5 miles below Earth's surface back in the day. And guess what? They bear the marks of intense and sudden shock. Now that's some tough neighborhood. The wildest collision of them all was with a planet called Theia. Theia, about the size of Mars, crashed into Earth with a mighty BAM! It was a colossal event that changed everything. Theia's metal core fused with Earth's core, while the outer layers of both planets got shattered and tossed into space. The result? A beautiful ring of debris encircling Earth. Now here's the coolest part. That debris didn't just float around forever. It started to come together, like puzzle pieces finding their match. And voila, we got our very own moon. Can you believe it? And this incredible moon-making process might have taken as little as 10 years or even less. Crazy, isn't it? Scientists call this whole moon-forming extravaganza the giant impact hypothesis. So next time you gaze at the moon in the night sky, remember that it's actually a huge chunk of our own planet. And by the way, Earth also had quite the adventure trying to create its atmosphere. In the beginning, our planet's first attempt at an atmosphere didn't go so well. It had a thin layer of hydrogen and helium that came along with all the stuff it gathered. But those gases were like sneaky escape artists and decided to float away into space. Bye-bye, gases. Luckily, Earth didn't give up. It went for a second round, and this time it was much more successful. Volcanic eruptions came to the rescue. They spewed out all kinds of gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and a whole bunch of other funky ones. Even meteorites and comets joined the party, bringing lots of water and nitrogen to the mix. Earth's atmosphere was becoming quite the party. But here's the funny thing. There was no oxygen to be found during the second experiment. Nope, not a single breath of it. The oxygen that was produced by the sun's rays splitting water molecules got gobbled up by chemical reactions faster than you can say, oxy-bummer. It wasn't until Earth's third experiment came along, life, that things started to change. Photosynthetic organisms took center stage and used all that carbon dioxide in the air to make their food. And guess what? They released oxygen as a sidekick, 
Eventually, the organism started belting out so much oxygen that it overwhelmed the reactions and it began to fill up the atmosphere. It took a while though, and it wasn't until about 350 million years ago that we got the oxygen levels we have today. About 21% of the air we breathe. So, from fiery volcanoes to mysterious oceans, this glimpse into the past reveals an Earth vastly different from the one we know today. It's fascinating to explore the ancient landscapes and imagine the early stages of life taking shape. Thanks to AI, we can catch a glimpse of Earth's remarkable history and appreciate the wonders of our ever-changing planet. So, stay tuned for more interesting journeys. In a frosty Canadian park, hidden deep beneath layers of thick ice, scientists discovered a bizarre skeleton they named the Frozen Dragon. The skeleton had been in the frozen ice for millions of years. It took experts decades to work out the species of this strange fossil. It was identified as a new genus of pterosaur. Pterosaurs were massive flying reptiles with wingspans of over 16 feet. Their heads were 3.5 times the size of their bodies. Pterosaurs lived 76 million years ago when they soared above the dinosaurs. Scientists described them as the biggest, meanest, and most bizarre animals that ever flew. The new genus has been named Cryodracon boreus, which translates to Frozen Dragon of the North Winds. In 2013, a young mountaineer was climbing one of the tallest mountains in Western Europe, Mont Blanc. He noticed a strange metal box poking out of the snow. The mountaineer pried the box open and found that it was filled with precious rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. The climber immediately handed the box to the authorities. It was discovered that the box likely belonged to a passenger on one of two flights from India that crashed into the mountain over 50 years ago. The box was valued to be worth over $200,000, and authorities are still searching for the heir to the small box of treasures. In northwest Siberia in 2007, a reindeer herder was on an outing with his sons when he noticed something strange in the ice. The man realized it was a frozen mammoth calf and immediately contacted the local museum. The calf was named Luba and was the best preserved mammoth mummy in the world at the time of its discovery. Luba had been in the ice for 41,800 years and is around 30 to 35 days old. From trunk to tail, the mammoth calf is roughly the same size as a large calf. If you're interested in seeing for yourself, Luba travels to museums all around the world. On the frozen continent of Antarctica, covered in layers of ice and snow, is Mount Erebus, the frozen volcano. The volcano was discovered in the middle of an eruption in 1841 by explorers on an Arctic expedition. The volcano is over 12,000 feet tall and has been active for the last 1.3 million years. Deep within the middle of the volcano is a huge crater filled with large volumes of molten lava. The volcano has occasional explosions, which means it's classified as being in continuing eruption. However, these eruptions are nothing to worry about because they are generally rather small. Back in 1991, two hikers were traveling across the Italian Alps when they stumbled across a body that they presumed to belong to a recently lost hiker. The duo trudged back down the mountain to report their unfortunate findings. Once the remains were recovered, it was clear that the body was not recent at all. Scientists determined that the Iceman was more than 5,000 years old and named him Otzi. The discovery was unlike anything scientists had ever before seen because the body was so well preserved. For years, Otzi was studied by scientists who discovered that our ancestors have a lot more in common with us than we ever knew before. Otzi was covered in ink body art. Research done on the contents of his stomach revealed that his last meal was dry cured meat, similar to the bacon we eat today. Otzi has at least 19 relatives living today, somewhere in Central Europe. Scientists were researching ancient squirrel burrows in Siberia when they came across something interesting. One of the squirrels had hidden away precious seeds deep beneath the ground. The seeds had been encased in ice for 32,000 years. The seeds were for the flower Silene stenophylia, which had long since gone extinct. 
Amazingly, scientists were able to recover plant tissue from inside the seeds and grow an entire crop of flowers. They've since reintroduced the previously extinct flower to natural habitats all across the world. In 1930, a team of Norwegian scientists sailed around the Arctic Ocean, conducting research on the seas and glaciers. They reached White Island, a dangerous and icy land no human had set foot on before, or so they thought. The scientists were shocked to discover the tip of a small boat sticking out of the snow. Frozen inside the boat, they found scientific equipment and various personal items, including a jacket monogrammed S.A. Andre. They had discovered the wreck of the famous Andre Arctic Balloon Expedition. In 1897, Swedish explorers, led by Andre, attempted to travel to the North Pole by hydrogen balloon. No one had ever heard from them ever again. People only found out what happened to them when the wreck was discovered 33 years later. It turns out that the balloon had crashed on White Island only two days after departing from Sweden. The explorers traveled along the island on a small makeshift boat, but were unable to make it any further. The best preserved woolly mammoth ever found was discovered in an area of permafrost in Siberia in 2010. Scientists named the frozen mammoth Yuka after the small village near where it was found. Yuka had been frozen for 39,000 years and is thought to have been around six to eight years old. Because Yuka is so well preserved, it has been studied for years and provided new information about mammoths. In 2019, scientists reported that they were able to activate cells taken from Yuka's tissue. Maybe one day, we'll have woolly mammoths roaming the land. From looking at pictures and videos of Antarctica, the continent appears to be freezing cold, covered in snow and flat, except for a few small hills. Scientists believe that too. When studying the Gumbertsev Mountains in the early 2000s, they were shocked to discover that the small rocky hills were actually the peak of a gigantic mountain formation under a mile of snow. Using radar technology, researchers worked out that the mountains are really around 10,000 feet tall and sprawl across 750 miles. This is around the same size as the European Alps, except hidden under tons of ice and snow. At a gold mine in Siberia, a businessman was examining a nearby river when he noticed something interesting in the frost. It was a small woolly rhino calf that was later named Sasha. The woolly rhino has been extinct for 15,000 years. It's thought that Sasha could have been frozen in the ice for up to 39,000 years. Sasha is unique because it's the only full-body woolly rhino to have ever been discovered. Glaciers around the northern Italian town of Palo have begun to melt. Artifacts from decades and even centuries ago have been discovered pouring out of the ice. Personal belongings from soldiers have been found things like diaries, photographs, and even love letters. Historians have even uncovered an entire cabin preserved beneath the ice. The cabin was filled with hard metal helmets and clothes. In 1845, Sir John Franklin embarked on an ill-fated expedition to the North Pole. The crew traveled on two ships, HMS Erebus and the ironically named HMS Terror. The expedition met with disaster and both ships were lost to the icy waters. In 2016, the HMS Terror was discovered by a team of researchers. Despite being lost for 170 years, the freezing cold waters had maintained the ship in pristine condition. Scientists described the ship as frozen in time. Dinner plates and glasses were still on shelves, beds and desks were still in order, and even the passengers' luggage appeared to be in good condition. The HMS Erebus was also discovered nearby, but due to changing water conditions, the ship wasn't in great shape. The glacial ice surrounding a mountain passageway in Norway that was notoriously used by the Vikings has revealed hundreds of ancient artifacts. One of these artifacts was a giant unopened wooden box that was welded together. Researchers were beside themselves with anticipation, waiting to open this box. They believed it would be filled with Viking treasures or artifacts that would give us an insight into ancient society. When they opened the box, all that was inside was a plain old beeswax candle. It turns out that this box wasn't actually as old as they thought it was. By analyzing the candle, they discovered that the box dates back to the 17th century. The age of the Vikings had ended by the 11th century. 
it's likely that the candle box belonged to a farmer who was shipping it from his summer farm to his winter farm to light up the long nights.